The Building Better Business podcast is the best place to learn how to take your business to the next level. It's no longer enough to earn good profits. You need to develop a network of connections as well as use all types of marketing to your advantage that will put you over the edge. Hosted by me, Steve Eschbach, a financial executive with decades of experience in dealing with businesses and business people, we'll learn how this all comes together. Join me and my expert guests as we delve into the many facets of owning the business and how to become a good, caring business owner. Listen how making a difference in your community can attract all sorts of clientele, which in turn will build you a better business. Greetings of the day, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Building Better Businesses. I'm your host, Steve Eschbach, and I am the owner of Transworld Business Advisors of Naperville. Transworld Business Advisors is the largest business brokerage in the world, and we are also the fastest growing Uh, We've been around for 40 years helping uh, qualified uh, buyers connect with sellers of businesses, all done on a confidential basis. Today, I'm delighted to have Paul Moore, and he's going to provide a different perspective. Uh, It seems like every time I have a guest, I have a different perspective, but not very many people wear the shoes that Paul wear. He went from a corporate conglomerate, Ford Motor Company, and his career path has got to where he is today. And I think it's going to be an exciting story as we go along. So first of all, Paul, thank you so much for joining us. And give me a brief introduction as to where you are today. We're going to go back in time, and then we're going to come back to the present. And then you're going to kind of give me the summary of the the highlights that you want to present to our audience. All right. Well, today I run a couple commercial real estate funds at Wellings Capital. We provide an easy on-ramp for people to invest in the very difficult to invest in space of commercial real estate. Most of the Forbes 400 wealthiest people in America invest in commercial real estate quite heavily, but most average people like us don't know how to get in and we provide an easy on-ramp. I started out as a, with an engineering degree, then an MBA, went to Ford Motor Company for five years in Detroit, actually worked in Chicago for a while with Ford. And then I ended up starting my own firm. After managing that for five years, Wall Street got very interested in the type of business I was in. And then a whole lot of people in 1997 went public. One of those firms wanted a Detroit office, so they overpaid for my company. And I was able to sell for $2.9 million. That was with a partner. And uh, I found myself in 1998 with 34 years old with a whole lot of energy, and a whole lot of non-knowledge. How do you say non-knowledge, Steve? I had lack of knowledge in how to invest. In fact, I blew almost all of the money I made from that sale. And I'm here to tell you, you don't have to, but that's what I did. Well, that's going to be a great story to follow up on, but I'm going to rewind the videotape a little bit. We're not going to go very deep into your past, but You know, you had stopped at the Ford Motor Company. I also saw on your website, HDTV, House Hunters and the like. So, well, I don't know how that influences where you are today, but tell me a little bit about your childhood. Where were you born and raised? What were your aspirations back when you were in your formative years? And what kind of influence did you have from your parents and the rest of your family? Very briefly, tell me about that. Yeah, you know, I grew up in southwestern Ohio near Cincinnati. And, you know, I knew one entrepreneur. I don't think I even knew what the word meant as a kid. Everybody I knew had a, you know, 30, 40 year career at a paper mill or a steel factory. And um, I knew one entrepreneur. He was a pharmacist who owned his little shop. And I was intrigued with that. But I found myself over the years more and more wanting to do things my way, wanting to do things on my own. And so when I found out in grad school during MBA that there was an entrepreneur's class, I jumped all over that. Good for you. Now, did your parents influence you in terms of uh, being bold and uh, being determined? Or is that something that you instilled on yourself? How did that all come about? (laughs) Yeah, I think I came upon it on my own. My mom always told me, I mean, everybody feels like they got mistreated in middle school, right? But when I was being mistreated, my mom always said, you're smarter than them. You're going to rise up. And even though you've got thick glasses and greasy hair and you're overweight and you have braces and you're a foot taller than everybody and they make fun of you, she didn't say all that, but that was true. She said, you're going to rise up and you're going to do anything you want. And she gave me the impression that I could do anything I wanted. And so I give my mom a lot of credit for the, uh, some of the fire and my dad, just an incredible 
he was a vice president level guy at a paper mill and stayed there for years and years and years. And he gave me a great work ethic as well. Good for you. So you're going through your formative years in grammar school, high school, on your way to college. We know you have a degree in engineering. And we'll talk about your stop at Ford Motor Company shortly. But how did you get involved in engineering? Were you a math aficionado or what What kind of drove the engineering preference, if you will? It's so funny. I actually think I made a mistake by getting involved in engineering. I was at a pool. It's already got a bad start, doesn't it? I was at a swimming pool my senior year of high school in May or June, right before college started, you know, three months before school. And I was telling my friend's father I wanted to play football at a small school. And he said, well, there's a school, Marietta College, right across the state, and they have this degree. And I said, I want to get a job, a degree in geology because I like rocks. I literally was that uninformed. And I said, I like rocks. I think they're fun. And he said, well, why don't you just go a step further and take a few more calculus classes and physics classes and not get a degree in geology? He said, why don't you try petroleum engineering? They drill oil wells. And I said, wow, that sounds exciting. Literally within two days, my dad and I were in a car driving four hours to Marietta College to learn about their football program and also this thing called petroleum engineering, which sounded good to me. So I signed up. Good for you. Well, I can tell you do not have the background of living in Connecticut because I did. And I can tell you that there are so many rocks in the soil that I absolutely despise rocks. So good for you. You didn't have that negative experience that I did. So now you're in college, you're getting your engineering degree. How did you get introduced to Ford Motor Company? And uh, how long were you at Ford, by the way? I was at Ford for five years. What happened is when I got my freshman year in 1982 in college, there were seven graduates of petroleum engineering with an average of seven job offers each. When I graduated in 1986, there were 89 graduates with a total of seven job offers. So I didn't even apply for a full-time job. I was nervous about you know oil price going from wherever it was to $12 a barrel. So I actually went on and got my MBA at Ohio State. At the end of that time, I was looking for something that combined engineering and my business degree and Ford Motor Company was interviewing. And so I took a job with Ford. So I crack a smile because you talk about oil going down to $12 a barrel. I moved to Denver in the late 90s and oil went down to $9 a barrel. Uh huh. And that caused the demise of one of the companies that I worked at. But this story is more about you. Believe so- it or not, I was in Denver in the summer of 85. And they said, we can handle oil price drops all the way to $15 a barrel, I think they said. And it went to 12 right after that. And Arco Oil and Gas shut down in the Rocky Mountains that was based in downtown Denver. Well, we can talk more about oil and gas in another episode. But so now you're at Ford and then there was a stop at HGTV and then you got into real estate. Now, I also got into real estate, but I'm more interested in your story as an engineer at Ford. Then you go to HGTV and now you're running a private equity firm that primarily does real estate. This is where I'm going to let you take the wheel of our bus and drive us down the path where you're going to give us the best lesson on your, and you said you made mistakes and I will correct you. No one that I meet ever again has ever made mistakes. They have just encountered learning experiences. So Mm -hmm. with your permission, you did not make a mistake. You had a very powerful learning experience. So now the story is yours. Take us on your little ride here, please. To that point, Steve, I actually have a podcast called How to Lose Money. And that's where we talk about how the mistakes, pain, failures, and losses on the road to success make us into who we want to be. We've interviewed 230 eight people so far. And we are really excited to get that message out to the world. So I agree with you. My stop on HGTV was just one episode on House Hunters. That's all that was. But yeah, I had a company. I left Ford. I started my own company and I never learned anything about investing, though I had an MBA focused on finance. I didn't know anything about investing at all. And so when I sold my company five years later, we made $2.9 million. I got 60% of that. And we uh, found that uh, I didn't know the difference between investing and speculating. You know, Steve, investing is when your principal is generally safe and you've got a chance to make a return. Speculating is when your principal is not at all safe and you've got a chance to make a return. And Paul Samuelson was the first economist in the U.S. to win the Nobel Peace Prize. And he said, investing should be boring. 
True investing should be more like watching paint dry or watching grass grow. If you want excitement, take $800 and go to Las Vegas. Well, I didn't know anything about that. I just knew I wanted my investments to be exciting. So I started investing in things that seemed, you know, high risk and exciting. And I started losing money. I made some money, but I lost money as well. And my mistakes basically cost me most of that, the vast majority of the money I made in the sale of my company, which was close to $2 million. Personally, I lost most of that in speculating. And what I found over many years of pain was that real estate is a, an amazing place to passively invest. If you sell your company and if you correctly invest in commercial real estate, it can be one of the very best vehicles out there. In fact, most of the Forbes 400 wealthiest people in America passively invest, some active, in commercial real estate and they perpetuate their fortunes and pay very, very little tax. And so when I learned that years later, I you know, can only say I wish I knew in 1997 when I sold my company what I know now, because I can help somebody who sells a company now for let's say a million dollars, take that million dollars and turn it into a perpetual income uh, generating machine that could help them to live the life they always dreamed of rather than going out and getting another job. And so that's some of the mistakes I made along the way, Steve. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's a parallel between what you're talking about and my podcast title, which is Building Better Businesses. So we're all talking about enhancing value in one way or another. Okay. Whether you buy a business, run the business, take it to the next level, you sell it, you use it as a strategic acquisition basis for another company. But what we're talking about for you, and this involves the real estate component, is that you know, you don't have to make wealth just by buying a business and running it. There's another way, like you said, that you can build the wealth for you. It's the way you're building your, quote, better business for yourself. So what else do we need to know about that, Paul? Expand on that for me. Yeah. So a lot of people watch HGTV or other shows and they think, oh, I can flip houses on the side and make a lot of money. And I'll tell you what's fun about that is there's a lot of thrill in the chase finding a vacant house, finding a house, you know, either on your street or in your nearby town that, you know, maybe was inherited and the kids just want to offload it for a discount. And that's really fun. The problem is most people who invest in those type of things don't get the returns they expect. It takes longer than they expect. It's much harder than they planned and they don't they're generally dissatisfied with this. And so some of them make them into a single family home portfolio. But everybody knows that's been in that a while knows that dealing with toilets, tenants, and trash, even if you have a property manager, is a huge hassle. Again, the returns and the time and the hassle involved is much worse than people think. So they think, well, I'll get involved in commercial real estate. And they say, how hard could it be to run a self-storage facility or a mobile home park? Well, here's the answer on the self-storage. It's easy to run a self-storage business if you want it to be mediocre. But if you want to run a great self-storage business, there is a much more difficult path that people need to take to get there, to maximize income and to grow value in a way that can really honestly produce extraordinary wealth. And that harder path is generally trod by experts, not people who just come in and they sold their business for a million or two last year and they want to buy a self-storage facility and they read a book or go to a class to learn to run it well. This is high-level stuff. And we find, and this is the way I invest, I'm putting my money where my mouth is, we find that finding those experts, whether it's self-storage, apartments, mobile home parks, office, retail, et cetera, in commercial real estate, finding the people who really know what they're doing and investing with them provides results that are phenomenal compared to doing it yourself. And your effort is limited to two things. Number one, the due diligence to find the right operator. And that's pretty tough. And number two, walking to the mailbox every month and collecting your passive income check. Oh, then number three, I guess, filing the loss on your tax return every year where you get a paper loss and you actually make money. Not a bad deal, trust me. So that's what we do. 
I, that's how I personally invest. That's how my company helps arrange investments for passive investors who want to get the benefits of commercial real estate, but who don't want all the hassles. Absolutely. So I heard a lot about finding subject matter expert, Paul. So there's a corollary to that where I think you need to surround yourself with successful people that may not know everything that you do, but have the same common goal. I think that's what I'm hearing you say. And plus your business is not only in one locale, it's in multiple locations, correct? Yeah, right. So when you find an expert that you're satisfied, I go back to the letters that I often talk about. It's K-L-T-R, no like trust. When you get those three down, then you have the refer. So I would imagine that's the same principle that you do and how you operate your real estate investment protocol, so to speak. Am I right about that? Yeah, it's absolutely true. And here's a quick analogy. I'm writing a book on Warren Buffett's rules for real estate investors. Warren Buffett, since 1964 to 2020, had a 2.8 million percent gain on his Berkshire Hathaway holdings. 2.8 million percent gain compared to 23,000 in the stock market, and that's specifically in the S&P 500. Now, Buffett, what he does is he finds a great, enduring, a durable product with a great management team, and he invests heavily in them. And he doesn't tell Dairy Queen what flavors to provide or Geico exactly how to do their marketing, but he oversees that, and then he provides a great compound on-ramp for all these investors. Think about all the Berkshire Hathaway investors who have had this 2.8 million percent return. They don't have to get involved in making ice cream flavors or selling insurance or selling mobile homes or doing mortgages. Berkshire's investors trust Warren to do that. And that's the same thing we do. We find the very, very best operators. We put a lot of trust in them. They're geographic, geographically diversified across the country. And then we've put together a fund that allows me and my team and then all of our hundreds of investors to invest with us. And we spread that money out over these commercial real estate investments that are operated by these top level pros. And the returns are actually quite surprising. <laughs> So I crack a smile as you give that response. You talk about picking ice cream flavors and dairy cream. I had a uh, small ice cream shop sell here in the local area. And one of the issues that closed was, do you want my existing inventory of ice cream flavors? Or do you want me to take them to my other location and you buy your own selection of new ice cream flavors? So I, I, it just hit home on while that <laughs> is not an issue for Warren Buffett, it is an issue with these, some of these smaller businesses. But right. you know, I marvel at the fact that you focus in on not getting into the day-to-day operations. If you find an expert that is successful, you try to take it to the next level. Am I correct in that? Is that what you're doing? Yeah, that's right. We look for people who have an amazing acquisition pipeline, a great operating team, and then on the other end, have a great place to sell their assets. And a lot of the money that's made in this business is from doing those three things really well. For example, in selling assets, if you can roll up, let's say, 10 mobile home parks into one portfolio that's well run and has a franchise component to it. And what I mean by that is they basically have similar branding, similar marketing, similar backroom, similar property management, and then sell that to a REIT or in a you know real estate investment trust or a commercial insurance company. They can often pay much, much more than an individual operator. So there's a portfolio premium A mom and pop seller can't get access to that portfolio premium, but a group, a middleman, if you will, can. And that's what our operators do very well. So I also crack a smile too, because there is a a correlation between size and value. And the smaller right. shops tend not to get the same type of multiples and uh, as the larger companies do. But in Paul, you know, we might find out that we're not going to cover everything today. I might have to have you back and get into the weeds and some of the other specifics. But I noticed that you are in self-storage, mobile home parks, and multifamily units. So those are three, quote, industries. What particularly about those kind of attracted you to kind of put your oomph, if you will, in those areas at this time? 
Yeah. So I helped uh, build a multifamily facility in North Dakota during the oil boom of 2010 through 15 in the Bakken there. And um, I wrote a book in 2016 called The Perfect Investment. And that's about investing in multifamily. And this book has all the reasons that uh, multifamily has the they have the diversification, they have the demographics, they have a long-term view that is very safe and very likely to provide a great investment. The problem is the perfect investment is no longer perfect, I personally found out, when you have to overpay to buy it. Apartments are largely overheated right now, and history will tell if I'm right that you know maybe I'm wrong, maybe they, they're going to continue to go up. But I got so frustrated a number of years ago with apartments that I actually decided to look out into self-storage and mobile home parks. And I was stunned to find out the number of mom and pop sellers in those arenas made it a such a fracture, fractured industry that it was much easier to find good deals. 85 to 90% of the 45,000 mobile home parks in America are owned by individual operators. They don't have the knowledge or the desire or the resources to improve the value by improving income. They don't care. They might have a cash cow. They might be making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. And selling to us for, let's say, $5 million might be a dream come true for them. But our expert operators can acquire this. Here's an example. $7.1 million mobile home park last February. It was acquired from a lady whose husband had passed away. She had never been to the mobile home park, perhaps ever, but for sure in five years, she lived three states away. She was thrilled to get $7.1 million. My operator was able to pass back utilities to the tenants, which is common in a 311 unit park, by the way. They were able to improve the place and raise rents and get them up closer to market level. They were able to begin filling the vacant lots in that mobile home park. And in less than a year, they sold this, the $7.1 million park for $15 million. And of course, the debt and equity was about 50-50 on that. So that was only three and a half million in in February. Then December came out as 10.5 million. That was part of my fund. Now that was an extraordinary example, but that process is what our operators do over and over. And so finding a mom and pop seller is critical to the self-storage and mobile home park world. And that's one of the things I like best. You can't do that casually. The guy like you or me or some of your business owners listening to this, they're not going to find those deals, but we can tap into a guy like this and be part of a deal like that. Yeah, I hear what you're saying, Paul. And I'm beginning to find that in some of the other industry niches, which will become part of a subsequent podcast. But rolling up some of those uh, mom and pops, if there's something that's bigger, better, stronger, it brings back to mind when I lived in Connecticut in the 1980s, there were about four or five small utilities in Connecticut. And the utility regulator said, you four utilities, you four gas utilities have got to combine your efforts. So you can get a better discount on your gas supply from the Gulf of Mexico because as individual entities, they had no purchasing power as a combined four team. And now if you look at any of the utilities in the Northeast, they're all combined. They're all subsidiaries of a major conglomerate. So there is some value in size. I guess you could say that. And we need someone like Paul who's able to see that from the outside looking in. We can't get Warren Buffett to help us out. I'd love to, but He probably has seen that over, what, 40 years, and he's already proved that that does work. But I think what I'm hearing you say, Paul, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you got to be able to look at things kind of outside the mom and pop ish, and you got to look at it, you know, how would this increase value if I were able to combine? Mm -hmm. And that gets to another element of what uh, Transworld does, is that you don't have to sell to an individual buyer. You can have strategic sales. You can have synergistic sales. There's so many different types of transactions that can enhance value. Am I saying that right? And if there's anything else I'm missing where you can enhance to that, that would be terrific. No, I think people need to realize that, sure, you can go out and sell your business yourself, but you need a professional to help you get top dollar. And and so going with someone like you, Steve, is so important to actually get top dollar, to actually expose your business to the widest number of potential buyers. You may see your business like you may see your HVAC business as selling to another HVAC business across town. 
but a professional who's rolling up HVAC businesses might be willing to pay. They may see the inherent value, the intrinsic value that you don't even see because they see that they have this massive national purchasing power and they might see your business as worth 20 or 30 or 40 percent more. Paying someone like Steve a few percent is well worth it. You know, it's funny you mentioned that, but uh, I totally agree with you because um, you're demonstrating that subject matter experts are key. Having a, a more global view of the marketplace is key. And I think that's where we can take everything going forward, if you will. Unfortunately, Paul, we don't have time to get more into the weeds. But as we discussed before, I think there are probably some elements of this discussion where we can dig a little deeper and find some more nuggets where you can enhance value. Is there anything that we may have missed in this initial summary podcast that you want to make sure our audience gets before we end this call? Yeah, I do. I want to whet your audience's appetite for another podcast. And that's, of course, so you'll have me back on. There is a powerful formula for commercial real estate. It's, it's not secret, but most people don't know this formula. Most people assume commercial real estate is valued like residential. It's based on comparable comps, you know, stuff in the neighborhood. It's not true at all. This formula makes all the difference. And this is why we could take a $7.1 million mobile home park in February and sell it in December for 15 million. And that formula is so powerful. You can go look it up or you can tune in next time. That'd be great. Thank you so much, Paul. Before we go, the final question I ask every one of my podcast guests, where can we go to find more information about Paul? You can go to wellingscapital.com. That's W-E-L-L-I-N-G-S. C-A-P-I-T-A-L, wellingscapital.com. And if you go there, I've got a free commercial real estate e-course or audio course where you can learn more about how to tap into the power of commercial real estate. That sounds so good, Paul. Thanks so much for sharing your insights. And like I said, there is much more we can talk about, but unfortunately, time will not permit us to do so today. So thanks for your time. Thanks for your insights. And uh, we'll probably do it again. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks, Steve.